Leah. Yes. I know everybody's name, so I'm not going to do say and spell your name. <laughs> yeah. Talk to us. Uh, why did we get our friends together today? Yeah, um, I just thought it was really important for all of us to get together that have kind of been here since the beginning of the movement. Um, we definitely have the people that started the movement here for medical cannabis and um, a lot of us that kind of came on down the road and I feel like it's important for Nebraska to know the truth about the families, the patients, you know, the caregivers and um, just to know our stories a little bit. So, I, And I hope people understand the history and the brutality of medical cannabis legalization in Nebraska. So that's my goal, and uh, these people are my mentors that um, helped start the movement. So I would just like to talk about the history and when it first started. So, and I know Sherry and Shelly, <coughs> You guys so. jump in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in August of 2013, and I specifically remember back earlier in that month that I was involved in a lot of online epilepsy groups. There was no Facebook at that time, I don't think. Um, it was more just like email groups and, and things like that. And uh, a lot of people were talking. It, well, actually, Facebook was started. Um, we're talking about a documentary that was going to be on CNN about, and it was going to be about medical marijuana, and a little girl with epilepsy was going to be on it, and it would show how much it helped her. And I thought, oh, you know, I for sure want to watch this. So Dominic and I sat down that evening and watched the CNN documentary, and by the end of it, we were just like, oh my gosh, you know, this maybe this could finally help Will because we had already tried so many different things, so many medicines, so many therapies, uh, we were just out of options. So I knew that this was something I wanted to try. I was um, very naive about it. I didn't know that it wasn't even legal here. <laughs> I thought I could just get a prescription from his neurologist at his next neurology appointment. That's exactly what I did. I said, we'd like an, a prescription for medical marijuana. And you know, now looking back, you know, he laughed, he chuckled, and. And I said, what? And he said, well, I can't do that. It's not legal here. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm asking for a prescription, you know? <laughs> well, that, I mean, I knew nothing about politics. I knew nothing yeah. about senators, how are you in a camera work? I mean, nothing. And uh, the online groups that I was in, all of a sudden, all these parent groups in different states were saying, hey, we're going to go to our senators, and we're gonna, and, because it's not legal here either, and we're going to try and get something passed, and... I'm not very good at waiting. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I can approach our senator. I got to find out who it is. So, you know, <laughs> found out. We ha did have an, an article that was ran in the newspaper, uh, was on the front page, and that's when Sherry got in touch with me and said, hey, you know, I want this too. So I was like, great, you know, we're not alone. <laughs> and we actually had other people who contacted us as well. Um, and we went to a town hall with our senator. It was a really snowy night. We dragged Will with us. We uh, went to that town hall, and uh, I shook and I cried the whole time that I talked to her and just said, you know, that I wanted, I remember saying, we want Nebraska to be the 22nd state to have medical marijuana legalized. And uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of empathy in the room, and that, from there, just kind of snowballed, and then we met other families, and then we, uh, Senator Crawford had said, okay, I'll bring up a bill, and she did, and like five days later, she dropped it. She said, she, it was like she chickened out. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's how we took it as, and she decided to withdraw it because she didn't feel like there would be enough support, and we were like, okay, so we, we were pretty um, devastated by that. That was probably the first big disappointment that we had. And then the following year, in August of 2014, uh, I knew that a lot of parents were visiting Colorado where a dispensary was developed with, and they developed the, the CBD oil that helped this little girl, Paige Feige. And we wanted to take the senators there on a trip 
and see, so that they could see that it's not some pot shop, it's not some hole in the wall, it's all, they have it all regulated, it's clean, etc. So Sherry and I and some other families. Uh, David, did you go on that trip? Okay. As well as some other legislators. Yep, we had three senators that went. Um, Sue Crawford, Davis, Tommy Garrett, and Al Davis. Yep, they were the three senators that came along. And uh, at the time, Dominic's better at this part than me, if I can remember right. At the, uh, Tommy was Republican, so that was encouraging. Al Davis, was he Republican too? No. He was Democrat, okay. He wasn't at the time. I was going to say back then okay, he was. Okay, I was going to say. Back then he was. Oh, okay. So then he was. Changed for the right. blood. Yeah. So again, that looked promising. Well, the next session was coming up. And Crawford said, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a bill, drop a bill. And she did, and it was very pharmaceutical driven. It was a no And Tommy was approached by Katie and... Um, Josie, I think, and yeah. and Bill Hawkins, and you were there too. Yeah. Okay, and they went to they went to Garrett's office and said, "This isn't good. What Crawford's doing? You know, we need something better." And Tommy was like, "Absolutely." He didn't even question. And Bill Hawkins, you know, I think he threw him some Kansas legislation and said, "Drop this." I mean, it was the last <laughs> day that bills could be dropped, and Tommy dropped it, and it had everything <laughs> i mean it was the pot of gold really it well, was it, kansas it was a kansas yeah, bill yeah. Yeah. it's a bill that would have helped everybody right who would have yep wanted yeah it, it had everything that we would have wanted right now laura uh, Ebke, yes so here hon <laughs> laura Ebke authorized the the drafting okay. of that bill okay and so we then we took that to his office and and uh, he had never even read it yeah because it was like 4.30 yep. the last day you could, you could introduce nope. a bill, and he hadn't even read he it. He knew it was the right thing to do. He was kind of skeptical, and it was, well, it'll get people talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, he must have... Did he have an uncle that was helped yes. by cannabis down in California? In, in Colorado. Colorado. Colorado, it was. Yeah, he had, yeah His he uncle did. had cancer. Yeah, cancer. Right. That's yeah. right. And that was the only thing that made him feel decent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think he went home and talked to his kids. I don't know, but he got he got really fired up about it after that. Made it his priority bill. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he was pretty incredible. He had a passion that At least the other senators haven't his, had. <laughs> yeah. Calling his office Woodstock and making a big joke about it. Yeah. Uh, my senator at the time oh. almost got into fisticuffs with him over it. With yeah. Tommy. Bo yes. McCoy. Yeah. McCoy, oh my friend Bo. I no. went after Bo the night of the bill. The night the bill went out, I called him a chicken. So, no. how about since I'm on Sherry? Sherry, do you want to start with like your beginnings? Oh well, okay. I, I mean, Sherry has gotten point. us way up to speed. Sure. And then, um, I guess um, it was like January 14th or 15th of that year when Tommy wanted to introduce his bill and. In the Capitol, under the rotunda, and um, his legislative aide called me like that morning and said, "Oh, um, we want you to say a few words." <laughs> and I had never done any uh, any political things or anything, and I was like, "Okay." And I thought it was just like a few words. But he had several people getting up and, and saying uh, like more than a few words, and I was not prepared at all. I was just doing it off the top of my head and. Brooke was there, and like right before I stepped up to say anything, she had a seizure, and we're you know like on camera and everything, holding her up, <laughs> and um, then I remember we had some posters up that um, AG's uh, secretary came up to us and later said that we can't have that. Do you remember what the poster said? I can't remember. Uh, something about seizures. Yeah. Stop the seizures. Stop the seizures. And she's like, and I think she thought it was about uh, the sheriff. And, uh, yeah, that it was uh, stopping arrests. Yeah. <laughs> and that was not <laughs> our <laughs> meaning. Not at all. Uh. But, uh, no, we're saying like stop the seizures in our children. Right. <laughs> the the IA, search and seizures. Know, yeah. and, um, then we it was crazy. To, um, start talking to senators to try and get them on our side and. 
Uh, so a bunch of mob groups would show up down there at nine o'clock. You know, they'd start their session, and you'd go to the red coats and fill out a form so that you could get somebody to come out and talk to you. And a lot of times, if they saw, I think it was LB six forty three at that point. If they saw, you know, and knew what your bill was, they wouldn't even come out. And then. If they did come out, I mean, I had one of the senators, after I said what it was for, just turn right back around and walk back in the chambers. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, how are we going to get anybody to talk to us uh, about this? And a lot of them would just, uh, I don't know anything about it. You know, I can't believe you want this. And they'd just turn around and leave. But there was a few people that would sit and listen. And I know I would have... Brooke with me, and she would um, <coughs> sleep on the benches outside the chambers. Mm -hmm. And then some of the um, people that were down there, the lobbyists, would say, keep it up, keep it up. Um, you know, they'll, they'll come around. And so I, I made it my, my deal to go down there once a week and just spend the day, and I would go down the roster sheet and all the people oh. that I knew were totally against us, I'd call them out. I'd leave all the other ones alone. Oh. Because they were already for us, so we didn't we didn't need them. And um, I remember one particular day, Brooke's very sensitive to light, and it was a sunny day under the rotunda, and I was oh. waiting for the senator to come out. And so I had to stay close to the chambers. And, you know, I'm keeping an eye on her. Well, then she goes, has a seizure and falls. And I, I know how how seizure are. Enemy and how it affects so she my she's life. crumpled on the floor with her service dog all tangled up and I'm your girls were there and they were standing by the door so I'm trying to get them all untangled and mm. the the guy came out and said oh are you Sherry Lawler and they're like no and they pointed to me and he just turned around and walked back in and the red coat came oh. over said do you need a medic and I'm like no she'll be okay but you know wow. it's just a really bad attitude out down there about um, the senators and how they just didn't want anything to do with it and how, uh -huh. you know, uh, we tried to bring up, you know, there's no factual information because it's kind of a catch-22 the way federally it is illegal and um, yet these states have states' rights and, you know, they have, um, they don't necessarily ha have it legalized but they have allowed the people that want to use it use it. And that was just with CBD. You know, we were just talking CBD at this point, oh. not anything THC related. Oh. So, um, you know, if you can't even get past CBD, and that's what I remember, uh, Ricketts was uh, the new shops that would come up uh, and start a business, and then they'd go bust them and take all their product away. And I know one particular woman up um, north... Oh. Of Blair, she got busted like three times, oh. and you know she basically almost went out of business, and then oh. that eventually she died of cancer. But um, you know what they did, and, and I know there was one in Scotts Bluff that got tortured too, just time after time, um, and it was just all for CBD. Oh. You know, it's not even illegal because. Uh, you know, the mm -hmm. Farm Hemp Act of 2014 legalized that across the board. So, um, mm -hmm. other than that, we got to a point where we mm -hmm. made it through committee. It was a mm -hmm. nine-hour hearing, and people were passing out, and they had forgot to bring their medications because we had no idea it was going to take mm -hmm. nine hours. And the room was packed, and, it was hot. and um, you know, it was standing room only. And... We also had brought in uh, Paige Figgy, Charlotte Figgy's mother, who was testifying nationwide at uh, the Capitol in D.C. and trying to get bills passed there. And uh, Charlotte was the little girl featured on right. CNN. Yes. Right. That's, yeah. That's so right. Paige is her mother. Right. Yeah. Yes. And I uh, went and picked her up at the airport, and we talked. We went around to some senators. We went to Foley first. And he was second in under Ricketts. And he said to us that day, he goes, this doesn't sound like what I thought it was, you know. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I think, I think, you know, maybe there's hope. And then we went to Senator Williams. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't say yes to him at all. 
Well, and he was like, I have thousands of constituents I need to, uh, you know, think of. And I'm saying, so you're saying my daughter's collateral damage? You know, by then I was in tears and I couldn't even talk. And Paige kind of took over talking because she was an expert at doing that kind of stuff. And But, you know, you just... Um, it's, it's like they were hot or cold. You never know who you're going to walk into. And um, otherwise, we finally got up to oh. out of committee, and we got a debate on it. And we thought we might have a chance because we worked it so hard, you know, getting people to call their senators and to write letters and let, um, you know, their senators know they wanted this, they were for this. <coughs> And there was a lot of things that went on that night that you just got um, to see how the legislature can work and work badly with the horse trading, as they called it. And, you know, we um, ended up that night three, three votes short. And there was like a phone booth in the back. The phone was ringing, and all of a sudden a senator changed their vote. And, you know, that was it. We were, we were done. So... I don't know who wants to take it there. Um, before you leave, Nicole, I want yeah, you to have some time. You're here, too, with the... Uh, I got involved in this. I met oh. Shelly and Dominic um, in 2009. I had a son who was diagnosed with uh, infantile spasms. I was on this parent group online and found some other parents who had um, children with the same diagnosis. After talking with Shelly for at least a few weeks, I think you did a little Facebook stalking, or I did this somehow, <laughs> yeah. um, realized we both yes, in Bellevue. That's right. So all of a sudden I get this message like, wait a minute, like we're, <laughs> we're minutes from each other, um, met up and it was the greatest gift I've ever been given um, by having, having them in my life and sharing their journey to help me through my journey. Um, so I've been fortunate to be able to see um, kind of all the things that they've done with Will and have been able to ask questions on medications and what have you tried and, and we do have, have very different kids but unfortunately they, they have both continued having seizures and we've tried everything. Um, my son went through a brain resection in 2014, um, the same time that, that everyone was headed to Colorado to go tour um, Realm of Caring, so I was not able to attend, have been kind of part of this group through mm -hmm. social media for a long time. Um, my family was military and my husband moved us out of the state to a legal state where we had the opportunity to, the opportunity was present for us to try cannabis um, with our son. However, because of all of the regulations federally, um, with my husband having a federal job, my son would have never been able to go on base to see his dad. Um, it also created issues for us. Our family is all from Nebraska. Um, all of my children's grandparents live here. We would never be able to leave the state had we started any medication with him at the time. Looking at all of those different things, um, we have decided that at, at that point in time, it was best for us to continue just regular pharmaceutical medications um, instead of trying cannabis. My son Jayan has gone through a brain resection where they have taken out four parts of his brain he has an implanted device underneath his chest wall that shocks his brain every 30 seconds. Um, and then just recently this year went through a second brain surgery where they split the two halves of his brain apart. Um, through all of this, he has continued seizing and still has seizures daily um, today. So it's really disheartening to see that everything that's out there We've tried. We've, we've really done anything and everything that, that's been presented to us, but yet it's okay for him to have brain surgery. It's okay for them to remove parts of his brain, but not okay for him to try a plant that grows in the ground that, that could, could 
very well be tracked and measured and safely prescribed like all of his other medications. Um, we were kind of talking earlier about things like opioids and, and controlled substances and the medications that my son is on. I'm not allowed to get more than two days before his prescription um, is, is empty. And if the pharmacy doesn't have it during that time, I'm having to call all of the pharmacies in town to find it. I'm driving sometimes 45 minutes away to get a medication because it needs to be controlled and tracked and, and, and made sure that he's not abusing it in any way. And we have these tools in place, but somehow I'm constantly told that we can't do that with this medication. We're not capable of doing that with this medication. The doctors that we have are able to take out parts of my son's brain to stop his seizures, but yet we aren't trusting the doctors in order to prescribe a medication that can help him. We're not trusting them to give him the right dose of it. You're okay with trusting him in literally opening up his brain putting grids on it, leaving his brain open for 30 days, removing parts of his brain, but we're not trusting those same doctors to be able to say, this is okay in this amount, let's try this dose. And it's beyond frustrating to me that, that this decision is left in the hands of legislatures who have no medical backgrounds, who have no knowledge of my child of all that he's been through, but yet they continue to get to make the decision and they continue to get to stop him from having that opportunity. And it's, it's devastating to constantly go through everything we've gone through being told, this is what you have to do. You go talk to your senators. I've, I've met with everybody. I've met with every single one of those senators and that didn't do anything. Um, being told that if you get this amount of signatures from people all over the state, pouring your heart and soul out to each one of them, telling them my child's medical history every single time to get their signature for other people to decide it's okay for my child to have it. And we did that. And it still wasn't okay. We've done it twice and it's still not okay that it seems like the finish line is constantly moving on us, that the people who make the decisions aren't the ones who are knowledgeable on making those decisions. And the people who constantly do the work to present that information are constantly being told, you have to do this next, you have to do this next. And it's, it's heartbreaking, it's, I'm tired. I'm tired of leaving my family. I'm tired of telling my son's story. I'm tired of, I'm tired of this bullshit. Someone else. You know, it's, it, it's, and it's the inhumane treatment from these people who are supposed to be representing us. I mean, the turning their backs and, and all this, and they're not representing the will of the people. Um, the signature gathering has shown and proven that, that the people of the state of Nebraska are different than the 35 people in Lincoln that control everything. It's literally 35 people that are, that are that keep this from happening because they have the legislative power in order to do it. And... Uh, when senators won't even listen to the fact that this many people in your district signed this petition, it doesn't make any difference to them. And, uh, it, and it should, because if they're doing their job, it's, they weren't elected for themselves. They're elected to represent the will of the people, even if it's an issue that they may not agree with. And that's, that's one of the biggest frustrations for me, is the fact that we know that the people in Nebraska are supportive of this. And not one senator mm -hmm. could tell you that they've had 5,000 people in our district call them and tell them they don't want you to support cannabis, medical cannabis, when in fact um, it's just the opposite of that. Um, I know a friend of mine who is a former teacher who was running for legislature in the last election and uh, in my district, and 
she said not she and she came to me before she ran and said, I support you on this issue, and I will support it and I will be supportive of it as I run. And she and I know for a fact that she asked people, and through her two years of campaigning, and she said not one person that she ever talked to said they weren't supportive of cannabis, not one. And she barely missed out on becoming a senator, but she literally asked the question of almost every person that she came in contact with in her district, and yet. It's the, it's the people who make the decisions are not doing it for those for those people who put them in the position to make decisions. In the latest poll, Nebraskans that are in favor of medical marijuana, 84%, mm -hmm. 84%, but it was by UNL. UNL. By UNL. And in spite of that, those numbers, that, that really uh, shows that they're not, they're not too no, and, and there's another study out there, another, there was one or something else, there's no one out that says that pharmaceutical companies in states with medical cannabis laws have lost, they're losing billions of dollars because people are turning away from pharmaceuticals and they're going to cannabis without ill effects. And so the pharmaceutical companies literally are losing billions of dollars. And there's where part of the issue lies, in, in my estimation, is the fact that um, there's there's money that they're losing, and as a result of them losing it, they're willing to throw people on the bus. And you don't have to look any further than the whole uh, the whole uh, opioid epidemic to understand that all the pharmaceutical companies are concerned about is making money. They weren't concerned about people's lives. I want to piggyback on that. Just how many times going to talk to different people, we've been told, you know, oh, we we don't want to become Colorado. We don't want to become Colorado, and to constantly say. You know, we've brought this as a medical bill over and over and over again, and yet we don't have to be Colorado. We could easily be Minnesota. How many times I've had to present to people, do you know Iowa has a bill? And everybody is just flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, cross the river, it's available there. There are doctors from Children's who have access and can help patients at their clinic in Council mm -hmm. Bluffs, but the second they come back across the river aren't allowed to have that mm -hmm. conversation at all. We don't have to look like something else. Again, we have the resources, we have the knowledge here in our state to be able to have a wonderful program here, and yet it's constantly stopped. The thing that is so hard for me to understand with all of is, you know, I came to the game later. I got ill with complex regional pain syndrome in 2015. So probably 2016 was when I kind of started meeting you guys and we were all speaking at the same things. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I'll never forget the first time I spoke and there was a woman holding a baby and the baby had seizures and she was talking and I spoke after her. I mean, I literally got up, I was like, that, that was just a woman with a baby having seizures. Like, what the hell? Uh, to, you know, because I knew nothing. I mean, I don't come from your guys' world. And the world of epilepsy, wow, hats off to all of you. Like, to hear even the conversations you have, like, most people don't have a clue what you deal with on a daily basis. And that's just the truth. You know, so... But the same to you. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, like, suffering brings great knowledge, right? <laughs> You're way more aware of other people than just yourself when you two are going through it. And, you know, I just was so shocked. Like, I knew I would have to, like, a, fight, a fat white woman, middle-aged white woman, come on, you know? Like, I knew I was going to be up against scrutiny and disbelief, but... I think you're against Ricketts. That's the problem. I am against Ricketts. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, and we had two meetings. I mean, I had a, a meeting with, I was, one of the times we were in the Capitol, Will and I were walking around, and I walked by the Attorney General's office, and his secretary, Suzanne Gage, knew, know, knew, mm -hmm. know us, knew us, knows us, knew Will, and she was talking to me, and all of a sudden, here comes down the hallway, here comes the Attorney General. And... I look, she introduced me to him, and I, and I looked at him and I said, why? And he said, and he, he, he literally said, Dominic, come into my office. So we went into his office, and we had a 20-minute conversation. 
and Will was with Will, Will and myself and, and the Attorney General. And I naively thought at the end that I had somehow gotten through to him as a father to our, talking to a father because he, he, was, he seemed kind. Um, and as we were leaving and walked down the hallway, he said, because I asked him, I said, do me a favor, please, talk to the Attorney Generals in medical states. Talk to the Attorney General in Colorado and see what they say. Is it, is it what you think it is? And, and, and because I don't, think, I don't think you're getting the whole picture. And as we're walking back down the hallway, he turned to me, and I swear, I thought he had a tear in his eye. I thought his eyes were watery. And he said, I, will, I promise you, I will, I will do that. And I have never heard, I've never heard he from never him. He never did. Six, six years, yeah. three letters later, not one word. And then the one meeting that we had with the governor, there were some of us here in, this, in the room were, had a meeting with the governor. It was like walking into a meeting, not even a meeting, but a give, being given an audience with the king because yeah. he couldn't get out of the room fast enough. Will sat, Shelley sat next to Will, and, and Shelley, sat, or she, Shelley had Will on one side and the governor on the other, and she showed him a 30-second snippet of a 20-minute seizure. And, his, and I watched. I wanted to see his facial expression. didn't change. It was hard the entire time. And at that point, I knew. There is, I could just, I knew from looking at the man and his reaction that there was, there was no heart there, there was no caring there, there was no sensitivity there at all. And as a matter of fact, Will had a seizure as he was leaving the room and he didn't come back. One of the aides that was with him did stop to see if he was okay, but everybody else just walked out of the room. He didn't they come ran. back. They ran up the they stairs with the yeah. security. Yeah, because one of the attorneys, one of the, one of the, one of the, Local news guys was trying to interview him too. Was trying to interview the governor, but he didn't. He never contacted us again. And yeah, I don't know these. Although he'll either. use it in his news interviews. News. I talk to those families. Right. Right. Ricketts will say. Yeah, <laughs> not. Right. I mean, and again, it's just the whole idea that these the politicians treat you as citizens like scum. And and our senators will keep saying. You need to talk to your federal legislators. And the federal legislators, you mm -hmm. go to meet with them, and they say, you need to go talk to your state senator. It's a state's yeah. right issue. And they just go back and forth, back and forth. And our senator <laughs> won't even answer our emails now. I email her, I email her no, numbers at a time, and she won't even, she won't even answer. Yeah. They won't even say everything. Yeah. They won't even answer, she won't even answer the emails. I mean, she doesn't even respond. Oh. Nicole's going to go out that way. Oh. <laughs> oh, can I grab that Ready for another ride, Will? <laughs> there you go. Uh, 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 you can't just jump over that? That's what no one does. You just jump over the top. The continuity of your hat. If you take off the hat, it'll ruin it. Oh, well, well, it's not your Put that hat back on. <laughs> no. I know. I'm going to pretty hairish. Good luck at the game. Hi, Nicole. What I think of, we get? Great. We had three brothers, and my mom knew all their names. Oh, three children. He had three children. Yeah. Even he looked in my eyes, and he was cold fish to me. Yep. Mm -hmm. He is a cold fish. You are right. One thing I wanted to talk about is that what people don't realize is, you know, especially with juvenile children, if you do anything against the law with them, there's a possibility that Child Protective Services could come swoop away with your children and, and cause you a huge legal battle to get them back. And your adult children. And, and <laughs> as well. I mean, my daughter is, will be 30 next month, and Adult Protective Services can be just as nasty as Child Protective Services. So, uh, you know, all the senators ask you, do you use it? Does it work? That's what I remember groaning would always say. Mm -hmm. I just want to know if it works. And you can't get out there and tell them the truth right. of, for the fear that you could lose your kid. And not only if you could lose that kid, if you have three other minor mm -hmm. kids in yeah. your family, they could all go and cause you misery for a long time. And um, I guess the unspoken thing is about how... Uh, with campaign finance, when you have a, a billionaire in the governor's office, how all the people that are campaigning will get um, money from him. And so how can they, with right mind, 
you know, not go with what the governor wants them to do in uh, voting for certain bills. Well, and we've seen it. Yeah. I mean, we all keep track of how much is getting, you know, paid from Ricketts to, you know, yeah. who and how they're voting. I mean, that's it's just common million, sense. It's been literally millions of dollars millions. since he's been office that's been spent on on either other candidates or a, or certain campaigns, mm -hmm. um, whether it be gambling or whether it be um, voter ID or whatever it is, um, or even um, campaigning directly against f um, for fellow Republicans when it came to the governor's race. I mean, Ugh. the amount of money that was spent by yeah. Governor Ricketts against Brett Lindstrom yeah. mm -hmm. and against, in particular Lindstrom, from my, from, from my perspective, was just, and it was all negative. I mean, and, and uh, um, it's just buying the offices again. Well, in the pharmaceutical industry, too, you look at, um, you know, these reports of where they get all their money, and all of them have, you know, thousands of dollars from the pharmaceutical industry as well as the beverage industry, too. Absolutely. And they, they are against cannabis as well because... Uh, they're afraid people will switch. They stand to <laughs> Competition. lose the most. Mm -hmm. yeah. The two groups that stand to lose the most are, are alcohol and, and uh, tobacco. Yep. And the pharmaceutical. And the states that have um, legalized medical marijuana have uh, decreased opioid over deaths, over, overdose deaths 25 to 35 yeah, percent. Yeah. That just shows you right there they're not using the opioids right. if they have the cannabis available. Exactly. And it's much safer. Well, and we all know seven years telling my truth up at legislature and I don't use any of those pharmaceuticals anymore and I proudly use cannabis you know well that's another point to bring up is that I know if I called uh, Brooks Pharma Pharmacy now and said can you run me what it costs a year on her this was at the very beginning um, $150,000 just in pharmaceuticals yeah. let alone doctors uh, labs, therapy, and surgeries, you know, and it's like, why? If a plant that we could get um, very reasonable, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And for all these medications and the side effects, that um, you know, it's just like, why? Why? Why won't you let us try? Well, and how often do we get as kids? Since he's not a kid anymore, he's not a juvenile anymore, but. How many drugs Will was on that were never that were never tested on adult or on yeah. kids? Yeah. They were always meant for adults, and yet, oh well, let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and give it to him anyway. Um, how is it's okay to give him a drug that's never been tested on adults, and yet yeah. it's not? It just doesn't make any sense. It's like like you said, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, some of the drugs that he's been on, and I'm sure that Brooks been on more. Well, he's on one that's more addictive than heroin. I mean, he's on Onfi, and it's more addictive than heroin, which is a which is a true Schedule One drug, and and yet that doesn't have any that doesn't have any impact. It doesn't have any bearing, and I think callously in my mind, some of it has to do with these kids. These kids are not what they con they consider to be contributing members of society. I mean, they're they're not going to go vote. They're not going to have necessarily have a job, and yet and so it's easy to just toss them off to the side, and it's. The blessings that this child and that child have given to so many people as a result of who they are and what they've accomplished and what they've done are greater than so many of us could ever give to anybody else who are completely healthy. Yeah. Well, besides, they deserve quality of life. Absolutely. And, you know, the pharmaceuticals don't do it for them. I don't know how many of them we've tried with her where, you know, she's bouncing from wall to wall because it's gotten toxic in her system or she's throwing up down the hall or, you know, or just can't function and sleeps the day, the day away. And, you know, it's... It's just so hard to hang on to the hope. Yeah. yeah. I mean, year I after year guys, after year. Yeah, I mean, like, years. Yeah. Years yeah. of gutting it out. And well, and it's, here we are. And it's crazy that when you say it like that, you're right. And if you, had you told me this ten years ago, I'm so hooked. I don't know what I don't know that I would have believed that I could be here ten years yes. later, yeah. saying, you know what? Through all of this, the ball has moved down the field, yeah. and it's not. 
it's not where I want it, but it's further than it, than it, than we probably ever imagined that it would be. And and we know, you know, I know Shelly and I thought we were the only ones, and then it was just you, and then it was you and Shelly. And it's like, and now we all know that it's th hundreds of thousands mm. of Nebraskans yeah. that are support that, b that believe the same way that we do. Yeah, we well, are yeah, getting those signatures. You hear yeah, all kinds of stuff. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, at first you think it's just you because you're li we're living our little life, you know, trying to do the best that we can, and then and, and to look back over the ten years and realize that we've we've changed some people's a lot of people's minds. We've educated a lot of people. And that's a good thing. And a lot more states have medical cannabis programs, I think Shelley oh, yeah. pointed out. When we started, it was 20. You want to be 22. the 21st? I want, we wanted to be 22, 22nd. 22. Yeah, there was and 21. And now what, 37 states mm -hmm. and a lot of countries. And uh, now, what is it for adult use? 18? I think it's 18, yeah. 18 for adult use now and back then. And we're just asking for medical. Yeah. Right. But these, right. these states uh, get medical and they realize it's not, it's not poisonous, it's yeah. not dangerous, and they go, what the heck, this is safer than any pharmaceutical, it's safer than alcohol. Yeah, it's it's, like, it's well, and, and they learn that more they effective than a, a lot of pharmaceuticals. Yeah. I mean, just think of how many people, like our, the reason we got into it was because our, of our son-in-law who had brain cancer. And there really wasn't a whole lot of hope for him. Uh, but um, cannabis has been known to help a lot of people with it. And it certainly helps with the nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. if for any cancer patient that mm -hmm. is going through chemo. And um, he had seizures, and it, it would have helped him too. But, you know, the stigma of using marijuana when it's illegal, he just couldn't do it. He just couldn't, you know, at that point, he just, he had a lot of medical professionals looking at him. He wasn't, he wasn't the kind that would just but, flaunt it, you know? But and the uh, only, only medicine he did use was, was cannabis that was pre well, procured. Well, he took a one Tylenol one time. <laughs> one Tylenol? But he, they wanted to do after chemo. After brain surgery the day after. <laughs> and then they wanted to do chemo and radiation, but then he would just lose his brain. So what was the point in that? Yeah, he and he lived longer than he was supposed to live if he did on radiation and chemo. And his life was much, much, much better. He was, he was pretty much functional until the last three, three months, two or three months. He was 18. I think he lived maybe 18 more months. And that's another son-in-law had me watch the film Run From The Cure. And that's where I saw how it helped uh, a lot of people for cancer. It saved people's lives. Um, one fellow that worked with us, Kim Beatty, two years ago, he uh, did the treatment, but he said he would lost so much weight. He said, if, if I hadn't uh, had cannabis to use, he says, I, think, I don't think I would have made it. He said, I don't think I would have made it. And so um, even if it, uh, some people just take it to have a better appetite, not not to lose so much weight, die from treatment. Some, right. I think more people die from the treatment from the cancer. Right. And so they don't realize that, that, that it, some of them, it, the, the cancer goes dormant because, or the cancer because of the cannabis. And, and uh, people don't, they, they don't even realize that can happen. And, and, and that's what made me angrier and angrier is that the more I found out I didn't realize all these ailments that it could treat. I didn't realize all these studies that were buried for decades. Uh, you know, I'll never forget finding the 1941 epilepsy study that cannabis was used and found to reduce seizures. And I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. it was just so infuriating to know that we're being lied to and, and we're having to find all this out on our own and, <clears throat> It was just really, really infuriating. And, and it became even more mind-boggling as to why we wouldn't do this, why we, how people cannot see how this could help, this non-invasive way. <laughs> well, that was in our pharmaceuticals before they had 
Dow Chemical Absolutely. Company. Mm -hmm. Now it was used as a compounding agent mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. across the board for all kinds of things. And then once Dow came around and they realized how much money they could make, um, again, it was the politicians that got rid of it. Right. And it's now now they won't they won't have it back. I think I read that you know, Harry Anslinger is the guy that did the whole, you know, he was the one that took it in front of the Senate committees in Washington first. And the AMA, from what, I, from what I've read, didn't realize that he was going to do what he did and that it would have the impact. So they didn't even send anybody to testify. Otherwise, they would have sent people to testify from the, Medical Amer from the American Medical Association to say, wait a minute, you're, this, you're wrong about this. And by that time, at that point, it was too late. And so it, was not on the it wasn't in the pharmacology anymore. And the American Medical Association, which supported the use of cannabis, they, their voice then was drowned out. And that's when the, the laws went into, a, into effect. And there was no stopping the train after that. So. Yep. And as a victim of it, what do you say? Yeah. You know, you go to your doctor, you try to do what they tell you to, and then in hindsight you realize they almost killed you. <laughs> and that was common. I mean, like, right. with, my, with my illness, with chronic pain, when I went to the Mayo, every single person in the room had been on opioids, benzos, and sedatives, and all at the same time. You know. That reminds me of our vet from Fremont that would testify about all his friends that were at Walter Reed suffering, you know, from amputations and just things that happened in the war and how um, they would just uh, give you prescriptions for opioids Absolutely. and everything. And he said there were several of his buddies that were there at Walter Reed with him that just died and they weren't necessarily abusing these meds, right. but it just killed them. And if they said, I want off these things, what can I do? They just write you another script. And uh, he also talked about all his uh, comrades that were committing suicide because they can't get this out of their mind, what happened uh, during the war. And they relive it over and over, whereas people uh, that take cannabis, it, it helps them sleep. It makes them forget these things. And they don't want to kill themselves. My daughter is disabled, and um, I'm very open with her psychiatrist that my daughter uses uh, cannabis instead of benzodiazepines, because they're prescribed those for their anxiety, and I'm like, you can stop breathing and die from taking that pill. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most highly addictive pills you can take. Now, do you think I'm going to feel bad that cannabis is being used? I'm very happy with my decision, you know, and I just think more people need to get that way and keep having open, you know, intelligent conversations mm -hmm. with their health care givers, because to me, that's where a lot of my anger is definitely pointed. We've seen the Nebraska Medical Association not support us. Mm -hmm. We've seen them show up and not support bills. You know, they should be the ones leading the fight. It shouldn't be patients fighting for their doctors to have a voice. Well, right. when he had his when he had his seizure in February and broke his jaw, and he was in, he was in the hospital for three weeks or for three day or for not for eight days, I asked every medical person that walked into the room for those over that eight day period what their thoughts were on cannabis, and Shelley can attest to the fact yeah. the nurses were like, absolutely, there is no reason in the world yeah. this is what we should be doing, and even the doctors that I talked to. But they won't. But they can't say it on the record because they're afraid, and they're afraid of the repercussions. But you know, even in the medical profession, there are there are more and more doctors that know and, and, and realize that this should be a tool in the toolbox. Yes. Somebody's saying it's a it's a magic bullet, uh, but it should be a tool in the toolbox. And what other? I mean, the other part of it is biologically, physiologically, we have a you know, the system in our body specifically meant to interact with this plant. That had to be there, that's there for a reason. <laughs> and it's like, and yet we're not, able to, we're not able to use that. And it's like, it's just nuts because um, the endocannabinoid system is literally there 
for that interaction. And yet we're being denied the ability to do something that may that helps to heal the body. So I'm just so tired about everything being about money. Mm -hmm. Not enough money. We didn't have enough money. That's why our campaign failed, right? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> you know, it just gets sad that we are all trying to do this to help other people. Mm -hmm. To give people freedom of medical choice. I truly, everybody that I have met in this room, in this core group, they definitely want freedom for others. Period. And how many of the politicians and the power brokers that we've met can you say that about? Not very few. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to steer one thing towards Leah, kind of what I've decided the point of my documentary slash series is. Whole plant, any use, like, that is your right. That was partially inspired by Wishart and Moorfeld when yes. they, one of the times this was denied, I don't remember which time it was, but... <laughs> To your point of, we don't want to become Colorado, we will become something better. Part of what I'm pushing now for, being a patient advocate or whatever, why I love Leah so much, is she goes to the medical establishment. Like, you were hitting up the Nebraska Medical Association, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, it's like, true. It's sad that we have to do that, but part of what I'm advocating for now is entire plant, any use, period. And putting that towards the spirit of fiber, and all the other parts of the hemp thing, I'm talking about yeah. environmental, economic, yes. agriculture in general, and how the human body works. Yeah. But that's where I'm entering this from. So if you want to speak to that, I know, David, you, yes. you're also a fiber yeah. aficionado, if I remember right, with sheep? Or do you do that economically? We have sheep. You have sheep. Okay. Yeah. Well, I thought, in my mind, when people see that, yeah. like, the first thing you're going to think is, oh, farmer guy is doing it for an economic reason. I know your story now, and I know that's not the case, but I just wanted a little bit of you talking about your family's, like, agricultural background, or you advocating for cannabis in general, not necessarily up, but yeah. I am you, a thousand percent the plant for any use, period. Like, that is my new thing, and we need, we need uh, legislative ways to deal with the bad kids in the room, but we're not going to penalize the entire class. And I think you're going to see that in this sure. session. Yeah. When it comes to hemp, because I think there's going to be some pushing on well, hemp. what hemp-derived products have and the, industrial, oh, and the industrial uses of it. Yeah. I know the Hemp Commission is yeah. really going to be pushing senators to do uh, stuff industrially. So, David, you may speak to that more than you know more about that than I do. Right? About the, the, oh, the industrial the, part, the hemp part of it. The Delta Nine and the Delta Eight and the Delta Nine. The, Delta 10 that are synthesized from um, from the hemp plant, and I'm not sure how exactly sure how that process, but it's a chemical process, and there's no regulation, so we don't know if it's safe or not safe. I think it's uh, uh, good from the point that people are seeing advertisements CBD and THC, and like it's already here. Why does why don't we why don't we legalize it? And uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's easy to raise. I know a, a half dozen people that are raising for their for their own use, and they can't stop it forever. With eighty four percent of the people in favor of it, and uh, uh, there is a patent uh, that's ran out already that the government had. I think six 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 three zero five zero seven, and uh, they had patented uh, cannabis as, as a neuroprotectant which means that it also would help with, with yeah, Alzheimer's. The government held that patent. Yeah, the, you know, I think Department of Health and Human Services, that's ran out. And uh, right there, there's, a, there's, there's another, another use for it. And, and my parents both died from dementia. So as soon as I saw Run From the Cure and saw that patent as neuroprotectant, I would take a dose of CBD, CBD every night to help me sleep. But also, hope, hopefully, that will will help with the, uh, you know, um, with dementia, and so um, I think there to, uh, there are, I know people that have anger issues and have families, and they don't get high, but they use cannabis every day to be a better parent. It helps them to like, oh, that's no big deal, and and 
where normally they would just they would just blow blow up. So there's there's so so many uses that that uh, it works really good for Crohn's type conditions or uh, if you have any kind of digestive upsets. I mean that that's a chronic problem. Um, we had a big party at the Capitol and we got enough signatures that you know a few years back and. Everybody, all my family was out there on the steps. I was in the bathroom. And I'm probably the only person that, in my family, that used cannabis in the Capitol to try and get myself back out there again because <laughs> there isn't any, anything that I can do to, to um, help me other than that. I, too, have used cannabis in the capital, and I'm very proud of that, so <laughs> it's all good. We have uh, members that, uh, that use cannabis in the junior, senior year in high school, and people are so afraid what's going to happen if the kids get straight A student all the way through. Straight, we're a straight A student and very successful now. Um, I think uh, one of our members was, was in a meeting, I don't know if any were you with that, with a senator. And he was told, don't tell anybody that you use cannabis on a daily basis. And uh, by God, he couldn't get through that meeting with, without telling him. But he was the same as you. He got off on all kinds of medications that did not help him. Yeah. He's, a, he's a veteran. And uh, uh, the, the senator had a nice conversation with him because he's like, you have your own business and, you know, and successful and use it every day and you're using it in place of pharmaceuticals that that made you feel bad and you couldn't function under. So I think, I think we need more people like him and Leah that, that go right into the centers and say, you know, I used it when I was a kid, or I, I use it every day now, and I use it for these reasons. And I'm sure that uh, all the reasons that people use it for medically are not going to get OK when we first get our medical bill. But we have to take what we can get. One, Nebraska was one of the first states and one of the only states to what, do what they call decriminalize. For one time it was, I think, first offense was only $100. And they raised it to, I think, 350 now. But I am really interested in seeing this go farther with the decriminalization. So that if we can't get a medical bill, bill passed, if you're using it for your kids, well, big deal. It's not, we don't, we don't uh, um, honor those laws. Or, or, you know, it's like, Leah, that's, you can tell the people because you're not worried they're going to knock on your door once they see you on, on TV. And, and, and uh, so I, that's what I would really say. Not, not uh, adult use, but just plain, plain uh, decriminalize. Just decriminalize it. And so that people can use it for, for medical purposes. And doctors don't have to worry about losing their license. And just uh, if they want to come, then come in with regulations or, or that you can grow it in a state later on, fine. But there are so many people using it now. And they should not be in trouble with the law for using it for, their, to, for medical purposes till they have a better life and their family has a better life. And we should be able to talk to our doctors about uh, you know, a, a solution to our problems that's, that, that is from hemp or cannabis. It is, that, you know, the, the most information we've gotten probably about how it helps us medicinally, <laughs> medicinally is with the bud tenders in Colorado. <laughs> you know, when you go out to visit and you go in there and they can educate you about yeah. how, how it, it treats you. And look, let's talk about Colorado. I mean, I am grateful, beyond grateful for Colorado because that's where I get my regulated medicine. But I'm breaking the law every time I do it. And, you know, I'm only supposed to be able to buy one ounce per day when I visit Colorado, but we all know that's not how it works. You drive to different dispensaries and they ask you if you bought for the day and you say, no, I haven't. And then you buy another ounce and then you go to the next one. And I'm grateful for that because that's what I do to get the treatment I need in this state. With fentanyl being the way it is, I do not want to buy from a, a dealer anymore. I am grown. I'm getting it from a regulated state. But the fact that I've got to worry about being a criminal for doing it 
being a criminal for coming back across state lines and getting caught. If I bring any altered form of the substance, then it's a felony. So, you know, people don't understand that. They're like, oh, fun, we'll get some gummies. And I'm like, well, good luck with that felony if you get caught. Oh, yeah. <gasps> what? Oh, yep. no, I'm not a druggie. I just want, you know, and it's mm, like, oh. Take care of that with decriminalization because we're exactly. only de decriminalized for flour. Right. Yeah. And, we need, and, and people are using it for medicine. Even people are against it say, well, how can you smoke a medicine, you know? So a flower, you can you can manufacture it, make what you want, but then again, Absolutely. it's a felony. So that's I think that's where I think that the, the decrim where that where well, that comes from. Our state in. now is surrounded by states. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, <coughs> South Dakota, Missouri. Yeah, yeah. as of February, drive. you won't have to drive to Colorado. You can go to Missouri. I'll go to Missouri. It'll be a lot closer. Yeah. And your taxes do too. Yeah, exactly. You know, Kansas still has a shot. I think they have a better shot than. Um, Nebraska, just because of their governor. Kelly was for it last yeah. time, so. They've been trying for a long time because we started been. out with a copy of their bill. Five years they tried before that, so they've been working on it for yeah, 15, 15 years. The heartland. Yeah. Three states left, Nebraska, Kansas. And, and, and we've, we've talked, talked about pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies being against it. Why is law enforcement against it? Exactly. Because they make so much money. In fact, they launder... They launder the money that they, that they take on the interstate. Yep. Yeah, the Nebraska law said that 50% is to go to, to the school system, 50% for law enforcement. But they have, a, they have uh, uh, officers that are um, uh, also uh, federal and get money from federal. And so we give all that money over the federal government, then they keep 20%, they give 80% back to law enforcement. Wow. Does anybody remember? Remember and, and a flood? they don't even often don't even arrest the people that have it. They get three or four hundred thousand dollars. Oh, find it strapped under the hood and the line. Oh, we didn't know that was in there. Okay, well that's fine. Just sign here and be on your way. Hmm. So it's it's. Well, I remember when Flood got up and made his big speech about how oh I know how to fix this. Uh, patients can just go to the state patrol office and get their medicine. And you know, get, get their, their cannabis, mm -hmm. and then how? Like a month or two later, that's when all the fentanyl leaked drugs came out of our state patrol evidence right. locker. So, right. best, best for our patients here in Nebraska. Well, and I don't even think, <laughs> from my understanding, testing wise, the state the state lab doesn't even. There's something with the with the state lab that it can't even they can't even test some stuff. Yeah, only and flour. Private, they have, they're using private labs. Yep. in order to do testing because they're not set up and able to do it. It costs, it costs so much. much. I understand yeah. Lancaster yeah. County is not it. prosecuting any longer for, for possession, possession, for simple possession. They're not even prosecuting for it. So they're yeah. already decriminalized yeah. on their own. Right, right. If you have a good lawyer. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a big... That's, that's, a big, yeah. that's true. The money. Because if you don't have the money in the sparse, then you're gonna, they're going to hammer you. But it's so insane with the way the market is going, honestly. Like... Delta 8, Delta 10, Delta 11, whatever. M my uh, daughter's fiance works at one of the stores in Omaha, and you can buy 120 milligram gummies with THC in it. When you go to Colorado, you get 10, 10 milligram gummies in a serving. So one, one mm. of these unregulated, that you know. Is. And that's one it's crazy. Of, that's a good, like I say, I think that's going to be an issue in the legislature this year. They have permission. Yeah. There's the, who, the person in charge of that, the person as the president, is going to make, the, is trying to make that an issue because there is no regulation. And look what you're doing. You're burying your head in the sand. You've yeah. allowed this in. You're not regulating it. You're not doing it. And it's like, and yet we can't get something to help us in a regulated fashion. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense because there, you could, they could be regulating it and taxing it and, may, and bringing in you know, revenue for it. And uh, I think I just have a real sense that something's going to happen in the legislature this year that has to do more where, they have, where hemp is going to get pushed, where the, the, the shops are going to get pushed. And then, but I think hemp's going to, I think there's something gonna, some stuff that's going to happen with them too. The industrial, for the industrial be. uses. Because it's, it's an, why the ag people in the state 
why why would you be turning your nose to something that is a revenue producer that you can plant what in a lot of places in Nebraska you can get three crops in and a, right. in a three rotations in in a, in a growing season and. And this would really help them outstate more than more than the yes. eastern part of the state because they don't have as much wild wild hemp out there, and they have the irrigation, and uh, they could grow it much more efficiently out there than we could here. And they, here. from what I understand, the ag department, um, the ag, the, the, the uh, school of agriculture, deep, uh, what's the guy's name? He went with us to Colorado. Dwight um, Cat or Dwight Cat? Dwight Cat. Yeah, has been. Collecting hemp from across the state, all the different varieties, they have all of this stuff. He's ready to go with it, and yeah. yet he keeps getting, they keep getting, he keeps getting the kibosh put on everything. Yeah. And he went with this, like I said, when we went to Colorado, he was there with us, and he was like, this is going to be great, get back to the state and get a plot started and all this other stuff, and here we are 10 years later, and he still hasn't had a chance, he hasn't really been able to do anything, so... The last two years, he had to pay for his plot singly, so one plot out of his own pocket. Is that right? See, so, and I know again, the president of the health commission knows him and is working. There, again, I just, I just feel like there's going to be some stuff that's going to happen, yeah. happen with him in this session. So. Well, Anna is is writing up a new bill, right, for the legislature. Apparently, I mean, I we don't know what it is. Have no idea but... what's in it. So much for transparency as there that goes, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's one of my frustrations as a family member, as yeah. a part of the, the medicinal part of it, is just the lack of transparency in the whole process. When we thought we watch were going him, to watch get him. more. <laughs> we thought there was going to be more, and, and it's. Can you sit down, buddy? Sit by me, Will. Have a seat. There you go, buddy. Um. Is this a good time to talk a little bit about Will and like the beginnings of you guys's? I mean, Shelly covered a fair amount. Dominic came in a little late. Yeah, um, I don't know what else. You well, know, we, just the, the, I know your story, but just like the beginnings of what his condition was and what year you first. You go for it. Um, okay, so Will was diagnosed originally with infantile spasms at four months of age. Uh, it was very subtle and wasn't even sure I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. Uh, we videotaped it and we brought it to the doctor's office and I didn't even know still if he was going to see what we were seeing. And, but he did and he said, well, you know, I'll go ahead and order an EEG just to kind of give you guys peace of mind, basically. Um, he had the EEG and it was very chaotic and it confirmed that he had uh, infantile spasms. Uh, his brain was just pretty much nonstop seizing all the time. They put him on an extremely aggressive steroid and uh, he had high blood pressure. He, I mean, he was just an infant. He, he bloated up so badly. Um, it was really, really dark time for us. Um, we had no idea what his future was going to be like. Um, we read some different stories that, you know, it's possible he wouldn't walk. It's possible he wouldn't talk. Um, he would definitely be developmentally behind, etc. Uh, <coughs> eventually, when he was four years old, his diagnosis evolved into uh, lennox gastaut syndrome which is also a rare catastrophic seizure disorder. Um, we knew that he had, after he had infantile spasms, that he had pretty much a 50% chance of going on to still having more seizures, and sure enough, he did. Uh, over that time, you know, we tried multiple cocktails of medications, pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, we just did whatever the doctors told us to do. They'd say, let's try this med, and we'd say, okay. They'd say, okay, well, let's increase it now, and let's add this med, okay. You know, and if every single time, we just kept doing it and kept doing it. And then when we started on this medical cannabis journey, uh, we were gonna have an interview, and they wanted to have me take a picture of his pharmaceuticals. And so I, I said, okay, so I put them all together, and I took a picture of it, and I was like, oh my God. 
this is what we're dumping into him every, I mean, it, we just didn't realize how much we were giving him until I took that picture. And after that, I was like, the next neurology appointment, I, I want him off. We don't even know what's working, what's not working because he's on so many different meds. And uh, we finally found a neurologist who was willing to do that because the first one we had said, no way, I'm not gonna do that. And so I found a neurologist who did agree to, and we thought that either his seizures would increase or they would stay the same. And surprisingly, they got better. He had less seizures. And we were like, this kid was obviously over-medicated. And he was down to two seizure meds rather than five. And we decided that he would never again be on more than two seizure meds. Uh, however, right now he is on three because they did add Epidiolex. Uh, we've done Epidiolex for four years now, at least, and not much of an improvement. Six, seven, I, but now. I felt comfortable adding that to his re regimen because I knew it wasn't like going to be like his other pharmaceuticals. So we went ahead and, and added it. Um, it would be the last one I'd really want to take away because, again, I know that it's not doing him any harm like the other two that he's on, like the one that Dominic said, it's more addictive than heroin. Uh, but, uh, we, you know, we've tried homeopathy, we've tried neurofeedback, we've tried uh, chiropractor. Um, we have not done brain surgery. Uh, I feel like that's a very personal decision among families, and no matter what decision you make, that's the right decision for your child and, and your family. And for personally, for our family, we just, because we didn't have that guarantee that it would help, we just decided that we didn't want to put yeah, him through the physical trauma. Well, a 50% chance of having I don't even think it was that high. And we didn't think it was worth losing what we had. Right. Um, the risk just wasn't just wasn't there for us. Now that's not the case for every family, but for us, that was just the way we felt about it. And and uh, so we haven't gone that we haven't gone that route with him. And the older he's gotten, the taller he's gotten, the worse the injuries have occurred. Uh, you know. When he was an infant, toddler, uh, ch small child, he could just wear a rubber helmet uh, and was fine. But it got to the point where he was continually smashing his face. So then we went to one with just a face bar and it, he was still injuring his face terribly. So then we went to the full face guard. And so that's where we're at now. And it has saved us multiple trips to the ER. Oh, um, the one last year. Right. He fell. He fell and hit underneath at the. Although this is a different helmet now, fell underneath and hit the, 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 the basically the concrete floor at school, and broke his jaw in two places. And, uh, spent eight days in a hospital. Then four and a half years ago, he fell and we used to have a hearth there. He had a seizure and he actually lacerated his liver and he almost died. So we the doctor when they took him into surgery didn't know if he was going to make it. Or not because he was bleeding, so his belly was just so full of blood. So, um, you know, the bigger, the whole adage of the bigger they are, the harder they fall is very, very much true and in evidence when it comes to Will and his drop seizures. When he has them, he doesn't know, and he just goes. Wherever he's at, that's where he, that's where he ends up. Whatever's in front of him is what he is. And although Will is 20, cognitively, he's about a two-year-old. Um, he is considered legally blind. He's still in diapers, completely nonverbal. Um, and just keeping him safe is pretty much our goal every, every day, day to keep him out yeah. of the ER. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he doesn't understand. We just went through the guardianship process, so we are going to be his, he'll always live with us. Uh, we also feel like that's a personal decision as to whether or not you want your child to go into a group home and. And um, for us, for now, we will we'll live with us until we're completely incapacitated. <laughs> Let me ask you this. For people with a similar um, epilepsy background, 
not exaggerating things, but what are some of the things that you've personally heard people say that somebody in a similar position in a legal state could experience? Like, 20% less seizures? I'm just making up. Examples. You know, <laughs> you know, no, nobody can give us that prediction. Nobody no, can give us that but percentage. Paige, Paige told us how how successful uh, the treatment was for her little Charlotte when she mm -hmm. was having what was it, seven hundred seizures a yeah. week? Yeah, and yeah. and a, she was on and the yeah, and yeah. she started the cannabis, um, the Charlotte's Web. Yeah, cannabis we, regime, and she ended up having one that next week. Yeah. And when we went to, out to Colorado, we had a chance to meet them. We met, we met Charlotte, and we met Heather Jackson, her son, who was also, I believe, still seizure-free, maybe, or I think, pretty close. But, and that's 10, 10 years ago, at least. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's not just anecdotal evidence. I mean, there's... There's too many stories out there, too many people who have moved to Col been able to move to Colorado and be able to be a part of that, you know, and, and that's and that whole the whole move to Colorado thing is another frustration for us. It's like what you get from senators a lot of times is just move, just go, just leave, or yeah. just go. If you're if you're half the parent you think you are, if it were me, if it were my kid, this is what I would do, and it's like it's just it's it's not as easy as that. Because there are no guarantees that it's going to work anyway. We just right. want the opportunity right. to, to, to try and to see. And I think that's the thing about all of us, too, is though we don't want it just for us. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, okay, pick up and move. Why should we have to? Right. <laughs> it's like you know. it, like the people in the Bible that had leprosy. They put them in a cave. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that means everybody... That's sick in Nebraska has to move to Colorado. You're right. Exactly. I, you know, that's what I, at Fortenberry's uh, town hall that I went to in Fremont, I got yelled at. And um, somebody in the back said, move to Colorado. And I'm like, you know what? First of all, my family's had a business here that, since 1896. Yeah. That is part of our livelihood. You have to uproot all the people that support you, you know, your your mother, your father, your brother, your sisters, aunts, uncles, and Medical they leave, community. and you cannot come back. <laughs> right. Because if you bring your child back and on a legal substance, you risk, you know, losing her or him. Yeah. And, you know, it's just not not a good solution when a state needs to take care of their own people. And it's not going to be a huge percentage of people that want this. It's just going to be maybe, you know, 10%. And they won't necessarily, uh, you know, use it forever. They just want to try it. But that 10% may have a good results. And, and going back to the brain surgery, too. Um, you know, Brooke, since she was like three years old, we found out about the brain surgery. And you just look at them like, are you kidding? This is my beautiful little child, and you want me to cut their head open? And, take pieces out and you give us maybe a half a chance that it's going to work and It'll and then work. what happens if it doesn't work and uh, that whatever they did during the surgery is permanent you know I kind of know what I'm dealing with now and I don't want to see any more um, you know disabilities uh, anything more than because I I I've searched this out. I've called like six or eight people that I know in the area that have all had the same surgery that they wanted Brooke to have. And I've really only come across one person that had a really pretty good outlook who lives in an apartment by herself with supports, is able to ride her bike over the hospital, which is close by to her, and, um, you know, does pretty well and doesn't have all the seizures she used to have. But... A lot of the people that have had the same surgery um, six months down the road, the brain has a way of finding another pathway. Um, or, you know, they were seizure-free for a couple months, and you're right back to where you started from. It may be different, but you're still having seizures enough that they even tell you you'll be completely seizure-free. Right. But um, just reducing the risk of being <coughs> Brooke has had probably about 
she usually falls backwards. And it's like a tree in the forest, and she's had about 50 staples in her head. And after about the third or fourth time of taking her in to have eight staples about every time, uh, we finally just said, you know what? Maybe we should do the helmet. And, and now she knows that the helmet has saved her many times. Um, but there are, there are times that it doesn't. And, you know, it's just kind of... Yeah, that's like the bottom of the time. Just, there's just no way to know what it is. Yeah, I, I read a story about a woman whose daughter didn't didn't react from her seizures from what normally used, and she kept experimenting with different varieties and combinations. It took her two, two and a half years, and she found what worked, really worked for her daughter. And then she had a son come up, the same thing. She said, I've got this figured out. That didn't work for him. It took her another two. And there that's why um, it won't, uh, people say, oh, it needs to be FDA approved. It can't be FDA approved yeah. because there are so many varieties mm -hmm. and then there's so many ailments that it worked for. It would take a million studies. Exactly. And do we remember FDA approval in the opioid epidemic? Yeah. Like, right. that's all yeah. I need to say. Right. Yeah, exactly. Please. Exactly. And, and what's the biggest one? I mean, alcohol. I mean, good Lord. How many people die from alcohol poisoning? Absolutely. And Mostly once a month. Yeah. Hundred thousand people last year again from opiate overdoses uh, from FDA drugs, and not one from cannabis. Yeah. Never. And it's like. And it's even if they say that it was, uh, you know, a contributing factor, they have. Right. If you're to autopsy, there'd be something else exactly. in there. Exactly. Yeah. It's different from being the apps. The the. The absolute reason why. I mean, the, I remember one of the one of the hearings. Some guy said, "You can't. It's physiologically impossible. You'd have to eat four pounds of raw marijuana to, and it would be because there's no tox. It's not toxic. There's no toxicity to it. And it's like it just works. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems sad that we're still talking about it. <laughs> I know. And it's frustrating. Yep. It's frustrating knowing that there are people who have died. Yes. We've lost people mm -hmm. who could have, would have benefited. Yeah. We've lost kids that we know where whose families have lost their children. And you know, something these people people don't think about is Shelly and I. Every day we walk in into Will's room, the first thing we look for is is his chest going up and down every single day when he's in there asleep and um, to have to do that every day and to, yeah. and to just be praying that uh, you hear his him intaking breath every day is um, it's it's sad I mean and it's it's gut-wrenching um, nobody should have to watch their child suffer like that and know that there's something out there that could be yeah. a benefit and yet being denied it because it's not part of the greater good. It's like, do you understand how many, like I said, or I had said earlier, it's like, how many, what is the greater good? What's the, I mean, what's the definition of that? I mean, well, I think how many children have, about the oil, really. Yeah. How many people have Brooke and, and, and Will and just themselves blessed just by their presence? Isn't that part of the greater good? Well, yes, yeah. from Andrews, if he's reacting, yeah, if I all. react to something, yes, it might happen. They are all God's children. They're exactly. here for some reason. Exactly. And in, in all their perfection, even though they're physically imperfect, they're, there's, there's a perfection about them that the rest of us don't have. In, in my, I mean, the way I look at it, I mean, the innocence and, and, the, and, and all that. Um, in their imperfect bodies, they are perfect human beings. So. I think there's a lot of people who know how beneficial it is, and they know how much it, it, much it helps them, and they do buy it illegally, and the source is, well, the person that they're buying it from and the source where it comes from, they have no 
They don't have any idea if these people right. care about them. Exactly. And oh, for sure. You, you really worry about some of the, well, it's like you said about the fentanyl. You don't yeah. know what it could be laced with, but it, it also could be laced with um, harmful pesticides or something right. as well. You know, it's nice in Colorado, you have a choice. We, you know, uh, when we buy our Charlotte's Web, we know it's a good company. And um, and they're really careful with yeah. how they raise it. And but, geez, if you're just buying from a dealer on the street, you don't have any idea. Well, how crazy is it that you go to Colorado and you have to have a card to a medicinal shop, but you can walk into a rec shop and get whatever you want? Yeah. I mean, that to me, I've never, I've <coughs> never understood where there has to be there has to be some rationale, some logic to that, but it doesn't. I don't see it. I mean, I think it's. I think there is a difference in the amount that you can get okay. based on your medical card, okay. and, and one's not taxed. I was just going to say the only difference is the tax. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I think you can get like three ounces as opposed to one. You know, like ratios are different. I don't know the exact amount. Yeah. But. Yeah. I just always thought that was, that was just. Yeah. It's the medicine we're well, look at me. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like, I go and I buy recreationally. But you're using it medicinally. I'm using it medicinally. What's interesting is when you go to a a place like um, you know the places a little closer to the Nebraska border, and you look at the license plates of the oh, cars yeah. out in the dispensary. They're not Colorado license plates. No, and no. the people standing in line at the medicinal so, counter, as opposed to the recreational, it's usually People like us standing in the recreational yeah. line. Mm -hmm. It's people that are old, that are hurting, that are sick, and yeah. and they're they're the ones standing there driving and standing there waiting in line to to get something that can help us that we should be able to get in our state. Yeah. I pull up with my handicap disabilities right in front. I'm like, well, here I am buying recreationally. <laughs> Thank you, America. <laughs> what a, what a country. It is, you know. I mean, like, literally the next state over, illegal. This yeah, state, yeah. not legal. Yeah, yeah that stupid line. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And that's why federal legalization needs to happen for patients. Yeah. Period. Because, like, for me, when my daughter went to school in Kansas City, it was like, oh, I'm a criminal here. Oh, but if I lived in uh, Iowa, I wouldn't be a criminal. Oh, I uh, popped over to Kansas. Now I'm definitely a criminal. But, oh, Missouri, no, I'm patient here. I mean, and that's a two-hour drive. And as, you know, think of being a patient, how you feel. Well, and, and to know and to know that and know the people in those states where it's illegal will go to, to the nth degree to arrest you yeah. to make the money off of it, knowing full well that just across the street, I mean, where's the where is the morality in that as well? It's like morality so and that, money. There's so many paradoxes about about, about all of it. Yes, there is. They just, just don't make any sense and. And if you, I always believe if you could let me, if I, if you would put us in a room with a group of senators without their aides, just to have a conversation, because they've never really allowed us to have conversations. No. There's always an aide sitting there. They're all, they're always looking at their watch. If we could have a period of time where with people just to sit down with all the other clutter out of it and just talk, like we're doing now. I believe there are people whose minds could be changed and, and that they would be willing to listen. But they've got somebody in one ear telling them one thing, somebody in another ear telling them something else, somebody they're worried about the money they got in their campaign, so they're worried about how someone else. But if you were able to have just a conversation, we, when we went out, Tommy and you and myself and Colin and somebody else, we went out to Western Nebraska. One of those years, it was before 6.43. And David, I don't remember if you were out there or not. But we did a media tour for a day out in western Nebraska. And we were in North Platte. And we were in, was it the fire station? I can't remember wherever yes. it was at. Yes. But we were speaking and, and we talked. And the, sh the county sheriff was sitting back there. And I still have his name. It was Jerome 
something or other. Yeah. I know who he is. And and I went back at the end when I got done talking, we were all finished. I went back and, and thanked them all for coming because there were state patrol guys back there. There were the county sheriffs back there. And I went back and I went back to thank them. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. I don't know where you're at. Blah 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 blah. But but the sheriff leaned into me and he said. He said, I said, I know you're law enforcement, I get it, blah, blah, blah. He said, he leaned in, he said, look, you, you've, you've changed my mind. Listening to you, I, feel, I look at this very differently than I did before. And it was like, hallelujah. But it was having that, that more of an intimate, you know, person-to-person -person conversation rather than it being a debate. Or a confrontation. Yeah, exactly where people where he was willing to listen and he and I really believe that I changed his that we changed his mind that <coughs> and that he looked at it and believed differently about the medicinal part of it. And um, that's where I wish we could get more opportunities to just sit down with a group of them. Have a group just have a group in a, in a room and have a conversation. What are your concerns? Then let us try to alleviate those concerns with what we know. But to most of them won't they won't take the time. Most of them, it's political. Yeah. If, if that, that wasn't, wasn't there, they, yeah. might, they might say, yeah, I know it's helped. It's helped some of my family. It's helped our neighbors. But when it's political and they might lose some money, especially when we have a governor that's going to... to uh, fund their campaign. Yeah. Or fund the person. That they run against. They run them against. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what happened. The first time. Yeah, when two we had two senators... Senator Johnson and Senator Seiler. Seiler was, was chair of the Judiciary Committee, voted for that bill every single time it was in committee to get it out. And then when it came time to vote on the floor, that was the night he changed his mind. And it was the same thing with Jerry Johnson. And it was like, wait a minute, you guys were supported all the way till the end. How do you now change your mind? Because Colin told us to come in because he invited it because it's passing. We got the votes. And Al Davis was going to vote for it, yeah, vote but for when it. they didn't vote, he, then... then for president, not voting. And I think well, was, Colin told him to do that. Yeah, because they, he said, so don't they, stick they, your they neck out because exactly, we don't have it. Exactly. And I, and I, and I, and I got yes. that. But for, but for Seiler and for Johnson, when Jerry Johnson got up to speak that night during the debate, I, I looked at Shelley and I said, something's not right. Because I could just tell in the questions he was asking and how he was approaching... His three minutes was 180 degrees different than any other time he ever talked. And it was like, at that point, I started getting nervous. And, and then when Siler was the same way, and then Glory didn't show up, and Al wasn't there, although they did get Al to get there before the vote took place. And uh, I was, we were distraught. I was so angry that night. Mm -hmm. And I stood Will up in the gallery that night. So they, they had to look. And Colby Coash was, was still a senator at the time. And Colby, he, he, he was one of the last to speak. And he said he knew where it was going at that point. Mm -hmm. And he said, look what you're doing. And he I don't remember if he, pointed, if he looked up at Will or whatever, but I purposely stood Will up because I wanted them to see him. This is what you're voting down. I mean, this is what you're voting against. And you know what? By the time we got down the stairs, they were this scattered and were just scurrying yeah. out of place faster than you could, you know, say hello. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I gave one of the boys a few words he ran down the hallway. I called him. I called him. Hey. Could have been worse. Probably was. Pretty strong. Dominic's <laughs> nice <laughs> on the words. <laughs> that was also the night that I had kind of a heated conversation with, with uh, Bill Hawkins because Bill was glad, Bill was glad that Bill died. Yeah, and I, and I was I was so. just livid at Bill at that yeah. point for the fact that he that he said well, it was good being that didn't pay. I said what I was, I was just mm. I was so angry ego we have met ego after ego after ego in this fight and that's the truth <laughs> and and they some of them the, um, that you they were afraid that if they come out and for and that was Al Davis he did he didn't think that his constituents would support him mm -hmm. and a little bit. Um, on the same note, but not quite the same. You know, we, two years ago, we started putting petitions in stores or, or asking the owners to allow their, their uh, employees to collect signatures for us. And there was one uh, own owner that had three stores in Lincoln, 
and they just didn't want to do that. They were afraid it would scare away some customers and, and that, and they finally said, well, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do it for Anna. And, but not in my store where the, where, the, where the soccer moms, not that store, the other two stores. And um, so um, she evidently found out that, that it didn't bother because this uh, owner opened a store in Beatrice and asked me to come down and gather signatures there. A sign in front of that store says CBD and THC. Yeah. And Nancy went to a concert at Pinnacle Bank the day, didn't you, and see the... Oh, yeah, I went... Uh, same um, store. Yeah, a week ago, we went to Pentatonics, and they were advertising on the reader board all around on the... On well, there's the, a shop here in Ling in, in Bellevue yeah. called the Cannabis Factory. Yeah. The what? The Cannabis Factory. Yeah, right here. But, that, but, but on that reader, it, it CBD had... CBD and THC. Yeah. 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 So yeah. people, all of those people saw that, and you mean, you can buy... get a little educated about yeah. the cannabinoids. Nobody's died from it yet, right. you know, even though it's right. synthetic. But the only form. bad thing about that is I know when we petitioned that sometimes people would be like, oh, isn't it legal? Because they're already oh, no. seeing oh, it. Yeah. You know, so... Well, and I think, confusing. though, that it's some people don't know the difference in... They don't have a clue. ...in CBD and no. medical cannabis. And, no. And, and somebody, a friend that I've been trying to educate, former deputy sheriff, been trying to educate for three or four years now. And he said, well, medical cannabis doesn't have any THC in it, does it? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, oh, geez. Die. Don't have to start <laughs> okay. over again. Like I said, though, anymore... <clears throat> the shops all have, they're all saying THC. All are saying so what's it. So the, what is the, this is once again. I think it's helpful to us. Actually. It is helpful to us. Yeah. Now. I, I agree. agree. I think it is. But it this is, is where the, the governor buried his head in the sand. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. just, without regulation and all that other stuff, and and yet, I, I think, why not just go go for it? Yeah. I, I worry a little bit about the, the upcoming <laughs> session that they're going to, someone against it is going to. Try throwing a, a monkey wrench. Make it illegal, yeah. Yeah. From, oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, they're well, going to try. Well, thankfully, they didn't get... I don't care what political party you are. I don't think... I, I think a filibuster-proof legislature is a bad thing. The what? I think a filibuster-proof legislature is a bad thing. It, it takes away from... Regardless of what side of the political spectrum yeah, you're on. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good thing. Divided government, my, in my estimation, is, is better government because it... It, in my belief, it causes people to have to talk to each other. It causes you to have to compromise and come to some kind of consensus. Um, when one party runs everything, then there isn't any of that. And the unicameral lost the uniqueness of the unicameral over the last six years. Yeah. And it lost what was good about the unicameral over the last six years because of the political, because of politicization, politicization of the whole thing. Yeah. And it's not what George Norris envisioned. It's not what the intention was. Um, and because his intention was Nebraskans are free thinkers, and a party doesn't matter. It should be what's best for the state. And that was, that's the whole idea behind the unicameral. And I'm, I'm so glad that, that it didn't end up that way uh, because I just, think it's, I just don't think it's good. I, I wish nationally there would be a third party that would come up and be able to challenge the other two. I think it would cause there to be more discussion and more consensus building rather than just one side, you know, fighting against the other side all the time. Mm -hmm. But in Nebraska, as unique as the unicameral is, um, I'll be curious to see what happens to it, if it can get back to where it was, because one of their first votes is going to be whether to make public the votes for committee chairs. And they want to control everything. One party wants to control everything. And... Uh, you know, and I just, so I was really, I'm glad that it's not there. I'm really, really glad. But it's too close. I mean, it's a razor thin margin. Um, and again, it doesn't matter to me which side politically. It's not good either side to have that much, that much power in my estimation. So. Yeah, anybody? Yeah. Anybody? I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Oh, That's a great place. We covered all kinds of things. <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> Without getting too much into the gossip weeds. Yeah, we really did pretty good. Only yeah. a few I hate rickets. 
<laughs> we could have done so much Thank more. You. <laughs> I will say, everywhere I've gone, no matter how <laughs> hippie, how conservative, the, the stain for Rick yeah. is what he did with the heart of the bag is yeah. universal. I'm sure. Well, I